be in the Gospel of John today. Uh, if you're here or at home uh, or over in Wilson County, go ahead and turn to the Gospel of John. And while y'all are going there, um, I just got to vent for a minute. Sometimes a preacher needs to vent too. So y'all, y'all got a second while you're finding the Gospel? Anybody else having a bad hair day today? <laughs> now, <laughs> I got hair. It's just here, not here. I've been having trouble with the beard this morning. I don't know if it's the mask or if it's the humidity or if it's both, a combination of both. It's both, right? So uh, ladies, I mean, y'all obviously probably have more issues with this than guys, but it's the humidity, right? Like my beard was just going nuts this morning. I thought maybe it was because I was in the pool yesterday and there was, you know, chlorine and everything, but man, I loaded up last night. Uh, I don't know how y'all's shower is. But my wife has like bottles and bottles and bottles of stuff. And I could tell even last night it wasn't acting right. And so, uh, man, I put conditioner, I put mask, I put um, anything that said moisturizing on it basically went in my beard last night. Like I thought, it's going to be great. And I woke up this morning, it was just like, Poof. and then I got it under control. And uh, now I have a big wave right here. And I think that's because of the mask because it it tucks it under like this. So just been a difficult morning for me. I told the first service, uh, if the masks stay around for long, the beard may have to go, because it is a real pain. No, don't be (laughs) amen in that. Y'all want to be wearing masks forever? What's y'all's problem? Like, we, you know, can do this for a little while, but not for long. So anyway, all right, here we go. Uh, That was for free. That just, I needed to get that off my chest. Has nothing to do with the sermon today. Just wanted to give y'all some time to get there. Uh, in John chapter 10. So this is a familiar text. Uh, John chapter 10 is a pretty familiar section of the Bible. Uh, We're going to be focusing on a super familiar verse, uh, John chapter 10, verse 10. But I want to read context today. I want to read 15 verses. We're going to start in verse 1 and read all the way to verse 15, because I I feel like sometimes we do this with Scripture, right? We just pull out one verse, uh, because we only have a short amount of time together, to, for, for the preaching portion of our worship. And so as a pastor, you can only communicate so much. So you pull out one verse and it's not that we pull the verse out of context, but there's this bigger picture that, that we miss. And I don't want us to miss what Jesus is saying here, because this is some important stuff, some stuff we really need to consider. So here's what it says, starting in verse one, Jesus starts, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I assure you. Now, anytime Jesus says something like that, when he's starting, probably means pay attention. Probably means you really want to listen to this and you really want to consider carefully what comes next. He says, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the door but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens it for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't recognize the voice of strangers. Jesus gave them this illustration, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus said again, I assure you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Here's our verse. A thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired man, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he's a hired man and he doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. As the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Before we get into the three points uh, from verse 10 today, I just want to make two bigger points about this text. Two points that I feel like we really 
cannot miss with all that's going on in the world. Um, I don't know about you guys, but the world feels super chaotic right now. It, it feels like it's, it's spinning out of control. There are voices speaking at us from all different directions. And, and I, I love this passage of Scripture because Jesus makes this incredible point. He says, my sheep know my voice, and they don't listen to other voices. They listen to my voice. And so I want to start this morning by challenging you and just asking you, what voices are you listening to as we walk through life, as you've been walking through this week? Because we've got voices in the media, we've got voices on social media, we've got, we've got voices of family, and we've got voices of friends, we've got voices we don't even know where they're coming from, but we're hearing them, and we're like, what's going on? Which voice do I listen to? Listen, there's only one voice you've got to listen to. The one voice is his voice. If you are his child, if you are part of his flock, if you are one of his, you need to listen to his voice and no other voice. Listen, I, I don't raise sheep. I don't have sheep. I've never been a big fan of sheep. Don't know much about sheep. But I tell you what I've got right now. I've got a good dog. His name is Ben. Some of y'all have met Ben. He's been a featured guest on some of my Facebook lives. Uh, he's a big dog, big black dog. And, and, and one of the things I love about Ben is for whatever reason, um, he, he's picked me. We, we adopted him from the local animal shelter. And uh, he, he, he knows that I'm the master. He, he can be out there playing with the kids. And I say, Ben, come here. And he will drop everything and he'll come and, and just sit right next to me. Last night, we were at a 4th of July gathering in, in our neighborhood, a small gathering of people. And uh, we took Ben with us because it was within walking distance. And we were over there, and there were people all around and kids, and they were splashing in the pool, and all kinds of fun activities were happening. And Ben was kind of eyeing a cat that he really wanted to chase. <laughs> he was kind of a distance from me, and I could see his old ears were perked up, and that cat was up underneath a, a lawn chair down there. And I just, I just said, Ben, come here. And boy, he just dropped it all and came and sat right there. Like, he knows my voice above all the other voices. He's for sale, by the way. I've been telling people. Uh, I do have him for sale for a million dollars. First million bucks gets him. Not a penny less. Um, he's, he's, he's worth every penny. So uh, if you're looking for a good dog, I've got one I'll sell you. Um, but not for a penny less than a million dollars. No negotiating. But, he, but that's the thing with him, right? He can hear my voice. And it's even better because he knows my wife's voice and my kids' voices. Other kids can be there and they can be playing with him. And one of my kids can call him and he'll run to my kids. Because... He knows their voice. That's how we're supposed to be with our Father. We need to know His voice. So I want to encourage you, church. I want to encourage you, church. Be careful the voices you're listening to. As we walk forward in history, it is going to become imperative that you only listen to the Master's voice and that you can distinguish His voice from all the other voices in this world that are trying to talk to you and trying to deceive you. All right, that's, that's the first thing. Second thing is this. Jesus is the only way to heaven. If you don't get anything else out of this text, I mean, he, Jesus, that's the point he's driving home here, right? He's the gate. He's the only way. If you want into the kingdom of God, Jesus is the way. There's not multiple ways into the kingdom of God. There's one way. There's a new covenant through the cross of Christ, through the blood of Christ, that is the only way. His name is the only name by which you can be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And if, if, if you're going to try to get in through another way, it's not going to work. He is the way. You have got to understand that. Because there are people out there telling you there's all these other ways. You can do it your own way. You know, you can make your own version of Scripture. You can make your own version of what it says. You can't. You've got to listen to his voice, and you've got to know that he is the only way. And that's true for you. It's true for your kids. It's true for your cousins. It's true for your brothers and your sisters, your moms and your dads. He is the only way. And, and I'm just telling you, church, these are two things we are going to really have to stand on in the days to come. We're going to have to listen for the master's voice, and we are going to have to continue to remind the world that Jesus is the only only way. All right? So again, that's just for free. Verse 10. 
Okay, that's what we're going to focus on today. I want to give you three things just specifically out of verse 10 for you to look at. The first one, if you're making notes, following along in your bulletins or at home, is this. The first one is this, the purpose. If you want to live in color, if you want to get the most out of life, if you want to have this full and abundant life that Jesus speaks of in verse 10, you have to know what your purpose in life is. You have to understand that. I don't think I'd get much argument if I just submitted this to you guys today and told you that I believe Jesus is, is, is the most perfect human to ever walk on this planet. And because of that, he lived in color in a way that none of us have and nobody in his day did, right? He was living life in color at such a high level among all of his peers and all of humanity. It, it, we just can't even wrap our minds around it. But the reason he was able to see in color, the reason he was able to live in color, the reason he was able to do all of this is because he knew what his purpose was. He knew why God had sent him. He understood what his mission in life was. And if you and I want to live in color, if we are tired of living in shades of gray, if we're tired of living in black and white, then we have to, number one, know what our purpose is, and then number two, get about doing whatever it is our purpose is. Jesus said this in John chapter 10. He says, a thief comes, this is verse 10, only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life. He knew what his purpose was. He knew why he was here. He knew why he was sent. He says, I have come so that they may have life. I love the way the ESV puts it. They say it like this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life. The New Living Translation, not a translation I quote from a lot whenever I'm preaching, but I think they do a beautiful job capturing the heart of this verse. It says, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. When when we think of why Jesus came to earth, we're quick to point to the eternal issues, the eternal things. We're quick to point to the fact that he came to save us from our sins and to redeem our souls. And certainly, yes, that is why Jesus came. Certainly, Jesus had redemption on his mind when he came from heaven to earth. Certainly, Jesus had restoration on his heart when he came to earth. Absolutely. He came to show us love and grace and peace and mercy and hope and all of that. But I think whenever we just jump to that, we miss the fact that he also came so that we could have life here and now. When you take an honest look at Jesus, when you take an honest look at the cross and what Jesus did on the cross, you're confronted with an amazing truth. He didn't just come so you and I could go to heaven. He didn't just come so that you and I one day could walk into eternity and into paradise. He came so that we would have a real abundant, full, amazing, fulfilling life here on earth and in eternity. He came so that we would be changed and transformed. He came so that we would be redeemed and restored and that the work of God would start in our lives even now, even here in this very imperfect place. That God could do a work so great in our lives that it would radically change us from the core of who we are, from the inside out. It's why he came. I have come so that you can have a wonderful, amazing, awesome, abundant life, both here and then, both now and in eternity forever. It was part of his mission. It was part of his purpose. He came to give us life, to change our lives, to bring us hope, to bring us peace, to bring us love, to bring us confidence that we could walk with him all the days of our life. I used to think that that I had to endure this life so that I could then get into eternal life, right? I just had to make it through. If I could just somehow survive as a disciple of Jesus, 
if I could just bear my cross long enough to get to heaven, then it would, would all be better. And that's true. It will be, right? But, but the more I've grown and the more I've matured in my faith, the more I've read Scripture, the more I've understood what Jesus did for me and for you on the cross, the more I understand that this life is not something that, to, that we're just supposed to endure. This life is something that we're supposed to embrace. It's something Jesus wants us to take hold of here and now. God's not just concerned with your eternal well-being. He's not just concerned with what's going to happen to you when you die. He sent Jesus because he's concerned about what's happening to you right now while you live. He wants you to be transformed today in a way that changes you radically and forever. So let me ask you, what's your purpose? Why are you here? Why do you exist? It's a question I've been asking myself a lot, particularly since all of this craziness has been going on. God, why did you put me here and now? He could have put me here 100 years ago. He could have put me here 10 years from now or 100 years from now. Why did you put me here? Why did you preordain for me to live in 2020? Why? What is my purpose? What part of your plan am I supposed to fulfill? Because until you figure that out, you're just living in black and white. Until you figure that out, you're not living in color. God has a race marked out for your life. God has given you and I spiritual gifts. He's uniquely gifted you for His honor, for His glory, for His fame, for His purposes. And until we get about using those gifts for His glory, understanding what our purpose is, we're just living in black and white. For some of you, God's given you a platform. A small platform, a medium platform, a big platform, whatever it is. He's given you a platform. What's the purpose of that platform? What's the purpose of that? Why has God blessed you with those gifts? Why has God given you those material possessions? Like there is a purpose behind everything God does. Our God is not one of chaos. He's not just up there throwing dice and saying, oh, this guy's going to get an oil well and that guy's going to get watermelons. <laughs> That's not how he works. That's not how our God works. Like, he has a plan and a purpose for everything. He's a God of order, not a God of chaos. And so what we have to figure out is what is his will for our lives? Why why did I get the oil well, which I didn't, but I got the watermelons. Why did I get the watermelons and he got the, the oil well, right? Why? What's the purpose? Why, why are we here right now in 2020? God could have put you somewhere 100 years down the road or 100 years before. Why did he put you here now? When you figure that out, you'll start living in color. Jesus was able to live in color because he knew what his purpose was. I came that they may have life. Why are you here? Got to figure it out. Number two, the potential. This is an important thing in this text. I'm going to have to develop this a little bit because some of you might want to send me an ugly email or give me an ugly phone call about this, but I'm going to try to do my best to explain it in the time I have. John 10.10, 10. the thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. The word may in our English translation here uh, translates potential. It may happen, right? We use this word all the time in our, in our language, right? There's the potential for something. Like you may lose weight and you may not. The potential's there, but you're not going to just wake up tomorrow and, and, and have lost weight, right? I'm going on vacation this week. I'm not packing the Speedo because it's too late. Like, I can't, I can't get my beach bod by Wednesday. It's, it's too late, right? But there's potential that I could get a beach bod by next summer if I wanted to be disciplined and work and, you know, eat right and do all that stuff. It may happen, but probably not. Your kids may go to school this fall, or you may be their teacher again. There's potential right now for both of those things to happen. You may get a promotion or you may get a pink slip. 
There's potential for both of those things to happen. You may get to go on a great vacation this summer, or you may not. You may, or you may not. There's potential. Jesus says that they may have life. That they may accept and receive this full and abundant life. It's not automatic. You don't just say a prayer, read a verse, get in the trough, get baptized. By the way, we had two this morning at the first service, get baptized, amen. Isn't that incredible? But I told them in the first service, it's not like you just get baptized and then all your problems go away. It's not like you get baptized and then poof, the full and abundant life appears right before your eyes. You may have it, but you have to embrace it. This isn't something we stumble into, this life. It's not something we find in a church or a sermon or a preacher. It's, it's not something that's just in a verse or a prayer or one simple act of obedience. This full and abundant life is something we have to embrace, pursue, and discover. Jesus told us that many would miss it. Places like Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 through 14, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through that one. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. And few find it. These are words we never really want to consider carefully because (laughs) there's work involved. That means effort has to be put forth. Few find it. Yeah, there's a a broad road, a wide road, a big gate. And that one's easy to find. It's easy to go down. It's easy to walk. It's, It's easy to go through. But Jesus says, that's not my road. My road is narrow. My gate is going to be much smaller. And few are actually going to find it. See, it's not automatic. It doesn't just happen. Finding the abundant life doesn't come from making a single decision to follow the Lord. It comes from devoting your life to Him. It comes from being transformed by Him. We have to look like Jesus and walk like Jesus and talk like Jesus and live like Jesus and give like Jesus and forgive like Jesus. We've got to be generous like Jesus and serve like Jesus and think like Jesus. We've got to care for other people like Jesus. We've got to do these things if we want to find the full and abundant life. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to come with me, anybody want to go with Jesus? He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. Three of you said yes. You want to go with Jesus? That's great. But if you want to, you've got to take up a cross and follow him. Like, he meant this. Somebody once said, I can't remember who it was, but somebody once said that if anybody wants to be a disciple of Jesus, if anybody wants to follow Jesus, they better look good on wood. Because that's what it means to follow Jesus. To be tacked to a cross. To be crucified every single day. To put yourself aside. To listen to his voice. To obey his commands. To run the race he put before you. To live your purpose out. Denying yourself is never going to be easy. Following in the footsteps of Jesus is not going to be easier in the second half of 2020 than it was in the first. It's not going to be easier in 2021 if Jesus doesn't come before them, and he might. It's not going to be easier in 2022 or 2025 or 2030. In case you haven't been reading the Bible, it gets worse before it gets better. It's not going to get easier to follow in the footsteps of Jesus at school, at work, at home, at the soccer field, in the oil patch, on the ranch. It's not going to get any easier to follow Jesus even here at church. It's going to get worse, and it's going to get harder. It's why you've got to know his voice, and it's why you've got to know he's the one and only way. It's why you have got to listen and find your purpose and understand that it's just potential until you grab a hold of it. 
That's where the full and abundant life is found, though, right? You grab a hold of it, and you let Jesus transform you from the inside out. Jesus said, I came, my purpose, so that you could have this full and abundant life, that you may have it. I love what Stephen Covey once said. He said, ineffective people live day after day with unused potential. It's no different for a Christian. Ineffective Christians live day after day with unused potential. How much potential did you leave on the table this week? How much potential did you leave on the table at work? How much potential did you leave on the table in your marriage? How much potential did you leave on the table with your kids? How much potential did you leave behind yesterday, the day before, the day before? Because here's what happens. For most of us, we get tired, we get worn out, we get stressed, we get overwhelmed by the chaos and the noise and all the different voices that are trying to speak into our lives. And we think, oh, it's kind of the end of the day. I'm just going to leave that potential behind. And then the next day we leave a little more behind. And the next day we leave a little more behind. And we get to the end of the week. And guess what? We've left a whole lot of potential on the table. And we get to the end of the month or the end of the year or the end of the decade or the end of our life. And as we draw our final breaths, we wonder, Why did I leave so much potential on the table? If you want to live the full and abundant life, you've got to understand it's not just going to show up, flop down in your lap. You've got to chase it. You've got to pursue it. You've got to run after it. You have to be a follower and a lover of Jesus. You've got to stay in tune to what he's saying. I see so much potential when I look around the world. I see so much potential when I look around this church. When I look around this room, I see the potential for restored relationships. I see the potential for freedom from addiction. I see the potential for peace in families that have been ripped apart for various reasons. I see the potential for grace to win the day. I see the potential for love to overcome. I see the potential for some to become missionaries. I see the potential for some to become full-time ministers, vocationally, preachers, pastors, youth ministers. I see the potential. But many people just leave it on the table to pursue other things. My friends, if you want the full and abundant life, you've got to understand that it's just potential until you reach out and grab it. So that you may have life. The problem is we have come accustomed to embracing life as it normally is, right? The normal life, whatever that is. Nobody knows what it is, but for whatever reason, that's what we're all chasing. I I don't know about you guys, but as I look back on the last 20, 30, 40 years, beyond my life, even the last 50, 60, 70 years, as we as Americans have been chasing normal, it doesn't look to me like it's worked out real good. Maybe instead of chasing normal, we should chase Jesus for the next decade. Maybe instead of chasing normal, we should chase the lost with the gospel. That's going to mean forsaking ourselves in this normal life that we've all come to love. But along the way, I have a feeling we're going to find what Jesus came to bring us. This full and abundant life that he talks about here in John chapter 10, but it's just potential. You may find it if you choose to follow him. Third one, last one for today, the promise, the purpose, the potential, and then we close with the promise. He closes this verse and says, and have it in abundance. In other words, I'm not going to give you just a little bit. I'm going to give you a whole, whole, whole lot When we understand why Jesus came, what his purpose was, when we discover our purpose, when we stop leaving the potential on the table, then we get this promise. See, what we always want to do with this verse is we want to focus on the promise. We want to focus on this full and abundant life. That's how it's always preached. It's how it's always talked about. It's how I hear this verse used in conversation. We always go and we jump right into the promise. And it it is a promise. But that promise is only fulfilled when you understand and see it as potential. And when you understand and see that that was Jesus' purpose, and unless you listen to his voice and follow him and are able to discern his voice above all the others, 
You will never find this promise in your life. It's not just an automatic thing like we normally talk about it as being. We have to understand that we have to die to ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus to take a hold of this promise of abundant life. Then and only then do we get that promise. You remember what we read two weeks ago? James 4, 14. You don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like a smoke that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Or the psalmist in Psalm 39, 5. You indeed have made my day short in length, and my lifespan is nothing in your sight. Yes, every mortal man is only a vapor. Life is short. We've all been reminded of that. Life is short. Why do you want to waste a single day of it? Why do you want to leave any potential on the table? Why continue to live in black and white and shades of gray when there's a a life full of color and abundance out there for you? Why pursue normal when you could be holy? Why pursue average when you could have a full and abundant life? Jesus came to provide it. He gives you the potential to receive it. But you have got to pursue him. And you have got to listen for his voice. So are you living in color today or black and white? Do you see things through shades of gray? Or are you seeing things clearly? When was the last time you heard his voice above your friends, above your family, above social media, above whatever news channel you listen to? We've got to ask ourselves these questions. Because if not, we will remain in this state of black and white living. When Jesus says, I came, I died, not only so you could go to heaven, but so you could live in color. So you could see and hear and know and be radically transformed. Listen, there is no life outside of Jesus. There certainly is no abundant life without Jesus. If you don't know Christ, if you're watching online, if you're over in Wilson County, if you're here in the room and you don't know Jesus, you've got to know this. There is no life outside of Jesus. You might be living, but you're not alive. You might be breathing, you might be thinking, you might be here on this planet, but you are not alive until you have been transformed by the blood of Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to the Father. He is the great shepherd who laid down his life for you. And so if you have never given your life to him, we invite you to do so today. Not by coming down here to the front, not by standing up, not by raising a hand, but simply by repenting of your sins and giving your life to Jesus. So if you're here, if you're out there, wherever you are, we want to invite you this morning as we close in prayer, as we consider these things. We want to invite you to consider Jesus most of all. Let's pray. If that's you and you've never given your life to Christ, again, we just ask you to pray with us. Just say this, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up, gone astray. And Lord, I know that without you, I have no hope of salvation. I have no hope of eternity. And so I ask now by faith, Lord, that you would forgive me, that you would make me new, that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would redeem my soul. thank you for your grace and for your goodness. Father, as we close, I Lord, I just want to pray for your people. What a dark and difficult time we live in. I'm not going to say it's the darkest and the most difficult the world has ever known because I don't know if that's true or not. But I know for many of us, Lord, this is the most chaotic season of our entire lives. Lord, I have spoken to people who have 
who have lived decades beyond my own life, people in their 80s, and one lady in her 90s who said in all of her years she's never seen anything like this. And so, Lord, now more than ever, Father, your church needs to see in color. Now more than ever, we need to be able to clearly hear your voice. And so, Lord, I pray for your people. I pray that they would be listening, that they would be attentive, that they would be sensitive to your spirit moving in their lives. Lord, I pray for the marriages. I pray for the mothers and the fathers. Lord, I pray that we would not leave potential on the table. That we would make the most of every single day because our days here are short. And Father, there are millions upon millions upon tens of millions of people, billions of people on this planet right now who don't know you. Father, may we be serious about your business with the time that you give us. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And Lord, I just ask that you would bless these who've gathered to worship you today. In Jesus' name.